This presentation is available for MCLE self-study credit. If you would like to receive credit, you must take three actions. First, click the show more text below on our YouTube page. The text will expand and show a link to download the handout materials. Once you finish watching this presentation, please click the quiz link to receive self-study credit. Once the quiz is successfully completed, you will receive a certificate via email within 72 hours. We hope you enjoy the presentation. Now, I have the privilege of uh, introducing Wayne Bully and Anna Sambold, who will present on how to identify and overcome your implicit biases, which qualifies for the new and hard to get implicit bias credit. Uh, first, we have Wayne Bully, who spent his entire career of 48 years as a trial attorney. He worked for only one firm during that time frame. He has tried over 70 cases and mediated hundreds of cases as counsel. His work was primarily in the personal injury, product liability, construction injury, and wrongful termination, termination areas. He is pres presently a member of the American Board of Trial Advocates and has served as president of the Association of Southern California Defense Council and president of the California Defense Council. He has worked as mediator for ADR services for the past 10 years with the past six years on a full-time basis. His success rate in resolving cases is over 90% and both sides find him to be fair and impartial mediator. Next, we have Anna Sample, who is multicultural, fully bilingual, dually qualified attorney and San Diego based neutral with eight year services. She has served as mediator and arbitrator in more than thousands of cases across the boards, a broad spectrum of civil litigation matters. She handles the full range of disputes, including commercial employment, civil rights, mass claims, consumer, real estate, torts, trust, and probate related matters. She speaks Spanish fluently and mediates and arbitrates regularly using both English and Spanish. Ms. Sambal has worked with people of all nationalities and has a clear understanding of the dynamics of mediating, negotiating, and arbitrating across national boundaries. She is also a negotiation professor at University of San Diego School of Law and has taught extensively in conflict resolution, cross-cultural communication, and ADR in Europe, Asia, and the Americas. Ms. Sample has been inducted into the National Academy of Distinguished Neutral, is an internationally certified mediator and arbitral woman. She was recently appointed as the chair-elect of ABA Dispute Resolu Resolution Section, co-chair ABA Mediation Institute, and vice chair of San Diego County Bar Association's ADR section. So Wayne and Anna, passing it to you. Thanks. Thank you, Hayward. So let me share this screen right now. Could you see the screen? I can. Um, yep. Yes. You may need to start your PowerPoint presentation. Good. Perfect. Thank you. Hmm. There we go. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Hayward, for the introduction. Uh, we are delighted to be here with Wayne and talk about this important topic. Our goal is to promote awareness and understanding of implicit bias and so we can all promote change in our society. So let's start with a question. Um, I want you to really think about it. Um, no need to submit your answer, uh, um, just think about it. Um, how you ever felt like someone judged you or without knowing you? Um, maybe, um, uh, maybe you didn't feel like someone judged you. Maybe you feel like you were judging someone without knowing them. Um, what was that based on? And how, how was it? How did that feel? Maybe you were judging someone based on their skin color, maybe on um, their language, maybe on the way they look. 
or maybe on their weight or maybe on their accent. And based on that, you assume um, this person's intelligence or competence or religion or perspectives or belief. And how we call this assumptions that we make? Well, those are called implicit bias. And these assumptions are subconscious. They come automatically to us, to our minds, and we don't even think about it. We, sometimes we are not conscious about them. And why? How, um, because it's, it's the way that, that our brain works. Our brains receive every, every second, receive millions of information. And it can handle all that amount of information uh, in our conscious mind. So a lot of the information is received and processed by the sub subconscious mind. And how, well, um, they, our subconscious mind just make associations and just jump into conclusions and assumptions and judgments um, just to um, uh, process information fast and quickly and, and allow us to interact every day and respond to situations, everyday situations. That's why you probably drive uh, from home to your office um, without even thinking about it. Sometimes you don't even realize how you got home. Um, well, that was your subconscious mind working and guiding you. Um, that's why you, don't, you didn't even realize that you got there, but you got home safely. So let's consider this graphic, for example. How many triangles did you see? You don't need to respond, you just think about it. A lot of people at first glance, they see three triangles, but the reality is that they're not. They're not triangles at all. Um, it's, just, it's just our subconscious mind assuming um, shapes, um, but if you see it closely, they are no triangles at all. They're just B shapes, uh, maybe like Pac-Man figures and shapes, but they're not triangles at all. That was our subconscious mind working and making connections and assumptions. So we can define implicit bias as all those subconscious feelings and perceptions and stereotypes that, um, and that they come to our mind automatically without even being aware of them. And, and keep in mind that those, can, those, those implicit bias can be positive or negative. And in, that's why we associate, for example, babies with cuteness and we associate bubbles with happiness. Um, they're not only negative associations. Um, and do you have implicit bias? Um, well, yes, we do. If you have a brain, you have a bias. And if you were raised on this earth, yeah, you you have a uh, you have a bias. And they come and they are part of your the way that your brain works. And and regardless of your um, race, of your social status, of your religion, of your sexual orientation, you're gonna have implicit bias. And for having this implicit bias, that doesn't mean that you are a bad person or you're a sexist or racist. It's something that we all have them um, because it's the way that our brain works. Let's look at this advertisement, for example. Everybody probably assumed that Alex was a boy, right? And after you read the second part of the advertisement, you probably realized you were all confused. Well, that's again, our subconscious mind working on, on playing and assuming things based on stereotypes. But where does this implicit bias come from? Well, uh, since we are born, um, this implicit bias develop unconsciously and we um, adopt them from our bringing from all the values that we receive from our family, from our friends, from our community, from all our past experiences and from our culture. 
everything that is surrounding us influence and builds up um, what we learn to associate and, and has how we learn to make assumptions and, and form stereotypes. And there's a big difference between implicit bias and explicit bias. The two of them are different um, mental constructs, but um, at the same time, they can influence each other and reinforce each other. But unlike implicit bias, explicit bias is plain and simple prejudice. Um, the best example is racist comments are an example of explicit bias. The people uh, are very aware of them, are intentionally um, having this prejudice and is intentionally communicating and expressing them. Um, they come to you know, automatically and um, uh, unconsciously. They are very intentional and very consciously formed. That's the big difference in between the two of them. Um, and what about the types of implicit bias? Because there are so many types, but let's talk about some of them. Um, let's talk about the stereotype bias. A stereotype bias is basically over generalizing over um, a specific group um, and just regardless of whether the individual members of that group, they have the specific traits or no, you make this over generalization. Um, um, so for example, if you have um, in your law firm, uh, somebody that is younger, you always gonna assume, oh, well, maybe because he's younger, he's good, good, with, good with technology. Maybe because he's older, he's no good with technology. That is a typical example of stereotype bias. Um, we have confirmation bias, and that's basically those bias that just confirm our preconceived notions. Um, so if, for example, we had been exposed um, to oh, leaders have been consistently been portrayed as white males, so we think that effective leaders must be white males. What um, another type of bias is affinity bias. Affinity bias is um, is exactly that type of bias that um, uh, make you favor or um, or you tend to gravitate to people that looks like you or is like you or reminds you of you. A good example is you end up hiring someone because they remind you of yourself because they are like you. That is an example of affinity bias. Perception bias is, for example, when we form assumptions about a group on, on, and it's, it's impossible for you to make an objective uh, um, opinion about this group, for example, in case of Republicans versus Democrats. Um, another type of bias, a pretty interesting, um, is the blonde bias. Um, I read a study that shows the salaries of blonde women are 7% 7 higher than those women who are brunettes or redheads. Um, another interesting bias is the name bias that shows that uh, preference for someone be, um, without, uh, um, based on their name. Um, it shows, the study shows that why people's names, they and Anglo names, they get called black more than names of people with uh, black people, Asian people. Another interesting bias is the handshake bias. And uh, probably after this, you wouldn't you would never um you will never see a handshake the same way. And this study shows that candidates with a better handshake, they're always um considered more hireable than the ones with no such a good handshake, and the decisions were made in a few minutes. Um, but why does implicit bias matter? <laughs> well, because in the implicit bias can influence how we feel, how we know, how we make decisions and judge others, and that obviously can in, impact and have an impact and detrimental effect we can have um, discriminatory actions against people just based on this unconscious implicit bias. Some uh, statistics that are pretty interesting is, for example, 76% um, of people, they associate males with careers and, and work and females with family. 
um, 70% of people um, associate males with science and females with arts. Uh, 75% of people in, have an implicit preference for white people over people of color. And another interesting um, data shows that at least 15% of American men are over six feet tall, but um, almost 60% of corporate CEOs are over six foot tall. So, and this implicit bias, uh, they influence the way that we make decisions everywhere and in different settings, in our schools, in our hospitals. Um, it's, it, there are different studies showing how doctors, they have implicit bias when they treat patients according to the race. Or oh, in policy encounters, we have seen in the news different um, encounters where police in, treat people in a different way. Um, in places of employment, we probably hiring someone based on our affinity bias or based on, on our, that we favor specific people over another one. Um, so bias decision making plays out in every setting, even in courts and even in legal settings. Um, and that's how um, we can um, end up being a not really a fair um, uh, advocate for our clients or imparting an administration of justice that is no fair and equal um, because implicit bias can appear and manifest in, in jury selection and prosecution and sentencing and recruiting employees at your law firm and work assignments and promotions and who do you mentor and all those settings um, Implicit bias can manifest and can influence how you decide, and how uh, and, and and they can have a detrimental effect. Um, that's why um, the state bar of California had um, after January first, twenty twenty two, they have um, they have required that all active lawyers in California, all active licensed lawyers in California that from those 25 hours of NCLD that they had to complete every three years, seven hours must include at least four of ethics, one hour of competence issues or so substance abuse issues, and at least two hours of elimination of bias. And from those two hours of elimination of bias, at least one must concentrate on implicit bias and the promotion of bias reducing strategies. If you're watching this program, we have designed this program to qualify and meet the requirements, the new requirements by the state bar. And if you're watching the whole day of uh, today, uh, you can earn up to eight hours of these MCLE credits that are required by the state bar. Please keep in mind that um, this new implicit bias MCLE requirement, it will begin applying to attorneys in the NCLE compliance group three. So um, all the um, last names that start with N through C, they must report compliance for the period ending on January 30, uh, 31st, 2023. So, but what we can do about implicit bias on um, what are the actional steps that you can do? I really believe um, that it's, there's no way that we can eradicate uh, totally implicit bias, but we can do a lot to mitigate and, and manage our implicit bias. Um, and that's why we wanna concentrate now. So the first step that we recommend is self-awareness. Um, Nothing can be um, managed and nothing can be mitigated if you're not aware of it. So being aware of um, that you have implicit bias and being and, 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 and really understanding and learning to be conscious of your own bias and your prejudice and your emotions and what triggers those implicit bias really helps you and is the first step to mitigate them and mitigate the impact that they can have on other people. Um, so um, in, um, how, how we can be more self-aware? Well, we can first question your first impressions. Um, is something that you react, and it seems like as a gut reaction to something, 
um, challenge it, challenge, challenge your stereotypes and question yourself and, and ask yourself, it's like a, maybe, why did I have that such a positive reaction to this candidate or to this person that I was interviewing? He, he didn't even have time to tell me more about his resume. It was just in the first five minutes that I met him, I, oh, I had this positive reaction and I really feel like a, I wanted to hire him. Why? Ask, ask yourself that kind of questions and identify um, what are you deciding in some way or another one. And obviously commit to ongoing learning and keep, keep questioning yourself. Um, another part of self being self-aware um, is identify microaggressions. Microaggressions are, are those subtle and sometimes unintended, um, I, I will call them micro insults that are referring to a person's color or race or gender or accent or stereotypes. Um, let me give you an example. Um, somebody um, at your law firm is, for example, having lunch and you see that she's eating something that is not familiar to you. And you make a comment like, a, you, are you seriously eating that? Wow. That is an example of microaggression. Um, and obviously can be very offensive. So we had to be aware of um, those comments and we had to stay away from engaging in type of in, in those type of comments. Um, keep in mind too that implicit bias are more likely when we are stressed or we are scared or we are exhausted or constrained by time uh, or when we are uncertain about the situation. So always adopt best practices for disrupting biases. Um, be alert for perspective, perspective that are not represented in discussions and meetings and get in the habit of justifying uh, what are you deciding and the way you're deciding. Um, you In the hiring process of employees, establish a criteria that is objective and be consistent with it. And be mindful of, everyday interactions with people and um, for example in meetings be aware of of is is everyone getting the credit for their ideas or for their suggestions um this is a good example of what happened on um, happened often in meetings and um, that's a very good suggestion miss wilson perhaps one of the men would like to make it does um great illustration Oh, in your meetings too, um, pay attention to who's getting interrupted or why are you interrupting this person? If it can happen to her, um, Justice Sotomayor um, in this study um, made by the, um, like they study all the Supreme Court justices and all the interruptions. And it was found that Justice Sotomayor was interrupted most of the time. Um, so the, the study assumes that is the effect of gender or the seniority, and that's why probably some people get more interrupted um, than other ones because they think, oh, well, she's, um, she's um, the younger one here or she is the newest one here, so we, we, we can interrupt her more. But how we can identify our implicit bias? Um, Wayne, could you tell us what we you recommend to sure. bias? Yeah, thanks, Anna, and and uh, what a great uh, presentation and helping people in our profession understand the issue that's come up. I, I want to go back to forty eight years, nineteen seventy one, when I started practicing law, and if someone had mentioned implicit bias to someone in nineteen seventy one they would have told them that they were crazy because there is no such thing as implicit bias. So it's taken that long to develop this issue that has become at least a problem in the eyes of the state bar to the point where, where if you want to keep your license and complete your MCLE credits, you must have at least one hour in trying to understand better that you and everyone else in the legal profession has these. So how do we identify something that is that is uh, 
not clearly present in your mind. It's, it's in your unconscious. Well, one of the, one of the ways that uh, you can do it is to take one of these tests that Harvard puts out. And the implicit association test on the right side of your screen, the IAT, I brought it up and I took three of the 15 tests just out of curiosity to see uh, how I was doing. And I think the three tests I took were of the 15, I took, um, uh, I took sexuality, gender, career, and race. And one of the results I got from, from the test was I learned that 64% of my responses showed that I had a preference for straight people over gay people. Now, 48 years ago, I'm guessing that number would have been substantially higher. Uh, since that time, I have, uh, you know, as everyone else has, has learned to, to accept and understand the, the gender issue with respect to uh, gays. I, I have family members who are gay. I have colleagues who are gay. I have do a doctor who is gay. And so it's, it's, it's still out there. It's an implicit bias, but I'm, I, I still need to improve on that 64%. And so um, it, that's one way. And, and there's so much on the internet, guys and gals. If you want to learn about uh, implicit biases, just Google it uh, on your computer and you'll be uh, able to look at documents and, and reports and um, records probably for the next uh, six months. It's, there's that much that's been written about it. So how do you uh, uh, regulate uh, and change, uh, switch? And next, next slide. Thank you. Uh, one of the best ways is to by self-regulation and what do we mean by self-regulation it's um uh, it's it's uh, adopting the ability to redirect impulses to situations so if if you have a gut reaction or an emotional reaction to something that you think is is triggering emotional bias you need to try and, and deal with it and try and stop that emotional reaction and that's why the best way to do that is to think, stop, pause, and think about it. Those are three great ways to deal with uh, an implicit bias. And, and also, if you can try and figure out why is this thing bothering me, uh, that's another way to do self-regulation. Uh, next slide. So what, how, you, how you do this, how you self-regulate, one, you, you, you can learn uh, by taking those tests, what your issues are, and strive, strive to put away any predisposition you may have to whatever implicit bias exists in your, in your, con, in your subconscious. So, and then once you do that, uh, you know, you, you have to do your best to counteract their prejudicial effect. If they're affecting you, you, you need to work and do whatever you can to, to make sure that hopefully this doesn't come up again, which it in all probability will. But if you work on it, um, as Anna said, we don't believe that you'll ever be able to eliminate implicit bias, but you can certainly diminish the effect that it has on, on your life and on your practice. And we have the, the ability in our practices to, uh, along with the responsibility to keep these biases in check and to try and not to harm or prejudice anyone. Um, okay, 34. Uh, speak up uh, if you are impacted by one. Uh, don't just stand there. Uh, be an advocate for eliminating uh, imp implicit bias uh, and be more empathetic to people that, that 
you either don't understand why they're doing what they're doing or saying what they're saying. One of the things that I've learned over my years is uh, one of the best ways, if someone is is speaking out against a particular race or a sex or some other type of implicit bias, is ask them questions. Try and develop facts that they have to support what they're saying, rather than dis just disagreeing with them and arguing with them. See, see if you can get them to explain. So it's it's imp it's important to speak up. Uh, to start a conversation, uh, to ask questions, to explain, you know, what possible damage you're doing from your from their behavior. Uh, I'm going to cite one example on myself. Uh, in 1975, I was taking a deposition in a personal injury case, and I uh, was representing a retired sergeant from the Los Angeles County Police Department. And long story longer, the, the police sergeant ended up shooting a gay neighbor um, or something that we don't need to discuss. But, but so I'm taking the depositions of the two plaintiffs and I'm, I'm 26 years old, maybe possibly 27 years old. And the deposition ends and, and I ask if I can talk to the attorney. He says, sure. So I said, look, why, why don't we try and figure out a way to get this case resolved? And he goes, that sounds very, that sounds good to me. I, I would love to try and do that. And I said, yeah. And so we talked, we started talking numbers and I said, well, geez, those numbers that you're proposing are so far out of line. He says, why do you say that? And I said, well, in a million years, no jury is ever going to believe a homosexual, which was the term of the day back in 1975 over a retired police officer. And the attorney looked at me and he said, really? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, you know, I'm a homosexual. So there I was with my tail between my legs and I just thanked him and I got up and I left. So there's a perfect example of, of what he did. He spoke up and brought it to my attention and that has helped me over the years to try and, and, uh, and nobody is ever perfect and you're gonna have again, no matter what you do, everyone has implicit biases. The friends you hang out with and the things you discuss, you, you hang out with people that are have the same thoughts that you do. So th those are the things you can do to help work on um, reducing. Uh, I like to call it reducing rather than eliminating. Uh, implicit bias. Um, okay, so if if you if you are in a situation where you can start a conversation and don't judge somebody and ask questions and uh, and, and listen, so you can ask questions, but listening listening is very important. If you don't listen to what the person is saying, I think you're doing a disservice to what we're trying to accomplish, which is minimizing uh, implicit biases. Now, uh, Ben Franklin, and I think we'll read this, said, remember not only to say the right thing in the right place, but far more difficult still to leave unsaid the wrong thing at the tempting moment. When you leave this, this web, webinar and go home, I want you to think of times that you wish you hadn't said what you said, because I'm sure each and every one of us have, have made that mistake. And I wish I had read this saying back in 1975, so I could have retracted or at least uh, not said what I said that day, because it was the uh, wrong thing to say at the moment. This next slide is super, super important because it is probably a, a, an implicit bias that most people read about, uh, have, their, have talked about, have dealt with with their children, um, and maybe even with their parents that have, have seen this. And I want to start with 
saying, I think it's important, first of all, to understand your own culture. If I asked you to write down what you think the American culture is in 50 words or less, I'll bet you you'll have a difficult time in doing that. And, and I thought about it for a period of time, honestly, and, and I came up with, it's difficult to come up with an American culture because there's so many different national preferences, so many different religions, so many different types of occupations that exist in our country that it would be difficult to come up with with one set cultural um, uh, one set cultural mannerisms. However, I do think that the American culture uh, is one that's that is based on success, on directness, on being outspoken on issues, and on focusing on the future as opposed to the past or the present. Now, relationships are part of, of, of who we are. They can strengthen us um, and give us reason to try and, and affect change. However, uh, it's difficult for us to understand cultural um, tendencies in, in other uh, ethnic groups or racial groups. So my suggestion is, for ex as an example, everyone on this Zoom has probably heard the word uh, Kwanzaa. And I, I'm guessing that many of you, as I did myself until I did some research, believe that Kwanzaa is an African-American way of celebrating Christmas. Well, in my opinion, that, that, that is not accurate. First of all, Kwanzaa was developed by a college professor and a civil rights advocate and an author by the name of Malawana Karenga. And uh, in 1966, following the Watts riots, many of you probably weren't even around or remember those, but uh, he came up with Kwanzaa. It's not a religious holiday. He came, out, he came up with it to be aware of the Black community. So part of Kwanzaa is they have seven candles, three red, three green, and one Black. The three red candles represent the struggle that they've had. The three green candles represent hope for the future for all of them, and the one Black candle candle represents people of African descent. So there you go. There's, there's something that, that uh, is an example of what we're, what we're trying to say here is, is if, you, if you make an effort to try and understand cultural competency, I think you'll, you'll be on your way to uh, mitigating or reducing any implicit bias toward that particular ethnic group or race that you may have. And there's certainly plenty out there that you can read to become aware of it if you're not already there. Uh, but I, my first recommendation is you learn your own and come up with your own culture and then start developing cultural, uh, cultural competency in, in others. Uh, the next slide, please. Thank you. And developing cultural competency is pretty much what we've talked about, which is you got to be open to different backgrounds, cultures, and viewpoints. You need to do some research. You need to do some studying. You need to try and understand why certain things are worn, certain things are said, certain things are, are eaten before you, you know, react in a way that uh, is negative towards your feeling about someone who won't eat a hot dog because it's not something that, that they're accustomed to, to eating. So being curious and, and learning, learning about these, these cultural uh, methods, uh, I think are so important, much more important than judging or making assumptions about them because of how they look, how they dress, how they speak, or how they act. The next slide is one that that I, I think we've made monumental strides in, we being the law profession, uh, 
in my practice, uh, uh, which it was a firm that I ran, I can remember having numerous diversity and inclusion discussions with the, the attorneys and the staff. And I think it's important if you're not doing that, that's important to do it, to develop and implement diversity in your firm or organization is another step in the right direction. So what, um, what types of organizational steps for can you take to, to mitigate or disrupt potential implicit biases? Um, you can review, first of all, review your own policies and take a look at them. And if changes need to be made, you need to make them. Um, you need to sit down with, with people of, of color or different religions or different, of different sex or different sexual preference and ask them what organizational policies or practices in this firm would you like to see? Uh, the second way, which is probably the best way, is, is to provide training and education. In just preparing for this webinar, uh, I've learned so much about a subject that I knew so little about uh, in my 48 years of practice uh, and uh, years of, uh, 10 years of mediating that it was, it was actually uh, refreshing to know that there are things that I can still do to improve this world uh, with the problems that, that we have. It's, it's, it hasn't been a, um, a, exactly as, 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 as I remember it when I was a teenager. Uh, there's, there's, there's more fighting today between different political parties, different races than there was. So it's, I think it's time to take a, take a step back and, and with respect to your own firms, you need to talk to them and give them, give them feedback, tell them what they're, how, to, how to help them along in taking the steps necessary to correct whatever uh, implicit bias problems you may observe uh, in your own firms. And I think it'll help the firm uh, in a number of ways. Uh, and I think for, for all those that are here that are, in, that are in larger firms, you're probably already doing something like this. But this, this, this particular slide gives you some additional information with respect to how providing training and education about different, difficult conversations with colleagues uh, is important. The next slide is to be part of the change. And what, what I'd like to talk about here is something that, that has been a, a thorn in my side probably since 1971. How many of you have heard this expression? Attorneys are one step ahead of car salesmen or attorneys are the, the, the worst uh, possible occupation a person can have because they never do uh, the right thing and they're never looking for fair and equitable decisions. They're only looking to, for things to promote whatever interest they have. And those are, again, that's, a, that's an implicit bias that the public has against us, against all of us who practice law or who have practiced law or are practicing law and so, you know, we need to be part of the change. We need to do this so that perhaps we can reduce the, the slur uh, or the negative comments that are made about our profession. There is nothing more frustrating to me than to go to a cocktail party and have uh, someone, someone come up to me and talk about how evil our profession is because did you see this this six million dollars that this person just got because they had a torn fingernail and 
and et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, they didn't realize or recognize that this was a this was a concert pianist uh, that had to cancel 15 different engagements because her finger was broken or hurt. And furthermore, it's people like that that don't serve on juries. You know, my response to them, to those that are uh, that are implicitly biased against lawyers, is because of the decisions that they're reading about is, what do you do when you get jury service notice? They try and avoid it. They do everything and everything they can to avoid serving on a jury. So if, if more people like the people that blame us were serving on this jury, I think it would ameliorate the outlandish decisions that we, some, we sometimes see. But I want you to know that, that um, this is my apple pie uh, statement. I do believe that the United States of America has the greatest civil justice system in the world, uh, but it could be better, could be better. Now, James Baldwin, who is another um, uh, he was an author. He's, he, I think he died roughly 35, 36 years ago. He was a civil rights advocate and he was a minister. And this phrase that, that is one of his famous phrases that he came up with is kind of interesting. And I want to read it verbatim. Not everything that is faced can be changed. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. But nothing can be changed until it's faced. That, that is, is so apropos to what Anna and I have been talking about in the last 40 minutes. Uh, and, and that is, we are now facing this. We are now facing this issue of implicit bias. Before, it was not addressed, it was not faced, at least in our, in our profession, not to this extent. So we've got a chance to change it. We've got a chance to ameliorate the, the severity of the implicit bias because we are now facing it. And um, before I talk about the resources, I wanna say that I hope that, that these last 40 minutes have been helpful to everyone on this webinar to recognize that we all, every single one of us has implicit biases. And that we all, every single one of us need to continue to work, to use the steps that we've provided today, to use those steps to work on reducing it to a bare minimum. If we can do that, our profession will be looked upon as the greatest profession that anyone could ever be, get involved with. And it will make every single one of us better people. Uh, now, for the resources. Uh, we provided a number of resources and I really would suggest that you, you take a peek at, at a number of these uh, articles that were written with respect to this subject. Uh, especially that I found that Maryville University article uh, very interesting. And the State Bar website, which talks about implicit bias training, um, it sh should be looked at and take those, those Harvard tests. I think you'll, they take about 10 minutes to do, about 10 minutes to, to take the test. And it's interesting, you have to answer them very quickly and uh, without really thinking about it. And then they give you uh, a, a rating afterwards. So it helps you understand where you need some work. And, and I would strongly urge and recommend uh, that you, you do that along with reading uh, any of the resources that we provided or any that you can find on your own. Uh, now, uh, Anna, do you have anything to add to? Oh, maybe, Wayne, could you mention something about the Riverside core forms? That oh, yes, thanks. Yeah, it, I was, it was interesting to find. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Riverside Superior Court has a form 
on, on, on explicit or implicit bias. And they give it to lawyers and they want to know if they've experienced any explicit or implicit bias. And, and you fill it out and you submit it. Now, the interesting thing is they don't want to know the case name, the court this happened in, the judge's name or the witness's name. So, so, but they just want to know if, if it's happening. And, and I guess the good news is if they get a lot of these forms and they see that it's happening, then they will take steps to try and correct this. But, um, and I guess I can understand why they don't want to know where it happened or because we all know that it can happen um, in, in a judge's courtroom. I, I know that I told this to Anna when we first started talking about this, that uh, I was a trial lawyer. And one of the first things that I, I learned from a very good trial lawyer was when you go into a judge's chambers for the first time, you want to get on his, on his good side or her good side. So what do you do? First thing you do is you look around the judge's chambers. You look to see whether he or she was order of the coif, where they went to school, whether they had the uh, diplomas, whether they had pictures of their family, on, whether they had pictures of golf tournaments, whether they had pictures of dogs. And you can learn a lot about the judge that you're in front of before he says word, word one about his procedures for trying a case. So, um, yeah, it's it's that's there's a resource that you can have to uh, to uh, try and overcome any implicit bias that your judge may have about you uh, by learning about him or her. Now, uh, we do we have time? It's, we still have like seven or eight minutes. So do we want to open this up to questions? Uh, before, um, I want to mention um, yeah. to the a really good way to find videos and podcasts uh, is in the in the Harvard University How's Martin Implicit Bias? Uh, and the website it has a whole library of videos and podcasts and really interactive demos that are really interesting. Um, I was kind of glad that we had this presentation today because I couldn't stop myself from watching videos after video and after reading and uh, many, many articles that they have in this website. And another podcast that I would really recommend is Hidden Brain is um, KPBS uh, podcast and you can download it and, and Spotify too and listen to it. And it's fascinating and talks about how the hidden brain or how the subconscious mind works. And um, there are so many TED Talks too that I really, really recommend. There's so many on um, YouTube videos about implicit bias. And I really, really recommend if you're trying to implement or come up with some policies, I really recommend the California State Bar website. They have a really good uh, list of resources for uh, that you can implement and adopt for your law firm. So those are our final recommendations. And be, but before um, we are done, I want to review some questions. Um, let's see. Thank you for uh, your candor. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know something happened with my internet. And it's between the speakers would have been appropriate. Okay, thank you for um. Well, thank you for all your kind comments. Um, actually, no a question. Thank you, ABR, for this is is been uh, uh for the class. Thank you for the program. Oh wow! Oh, thank you for all your kind comments on on trying to find. Do we have any questions? It seems like. Oh, I found one. Does the blonde bias hold up in different ethnic groups? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that. The study that I found was, um, and um, they basically just evaluated and they determined that uh, women with blonde hair, they make um, more money than women with red hair or with brunettes. Um, what is the presenter's uh, assumption that everyone is taking is 
he's talking to also is an older cisgender white man. Um, well, um, we don't make the assumptions and that is uh, probably was just um, some a comment that we made, but it wasn't unintentional. We assume that everybody's different and everybody has uh, different. Um, 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 another question, since we are supposed to say something, it does not seem compare bias against uh, people within and outside the legal system are the same as society in general. Um, I think so there's a comment. The issue of implicit bias as to political affiliation. Uh, as we know, this can be overlapped with religion and vaccination status. Did you have any suggestions on how to navigate these delicate situations in the law firm contest? Wayne, did you have any suggestions to handle those implicit bias as to for political affi affiliations, religion, vaccination status? You know, I think I, I think if we just do what some of the things we suggested, such as listen, listen, ask questions, try and try and diffuse the person that's that is that seems to be arguing. Uh, or demeaning one of the political parties. And I, I just think if, if we use the, the, the method of asking questions and not being confrontational, that it will go a long way toward, toward working, uh, working it out. I, I, you know, what do they say? Politics and religion are two subjects that sh should never be discussed um, in groups because there are so many different attitudes. I personally, personally enjoy discussions like that. And in fact, if, 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 if somebody says something that I believe in, I will take the other side just to hear what that person has to say to either increase my knowledge on, on why I, I, I feel the way I do. That is a great and excellent advice to, um, in, in matters of religion, politics, vaccination status, is better to just um, trying to um, have a conversation, but uh, be open on, on ask questions and listening to different perspectives before right. making assumptions. Anna, before making any assumptions on your own. And I want, I want to make one little comment about something that, sure. was, that you said earlier, and that is, you know, I'm an older white man, and uh, I have learned a lot. I have learned a lot from this, this talk. And I have vowed to make changes in my, in my attitudes and in my styles because of what I've learned. So it's never too late. I doubt if there's anybody out there on this webinar that's as old as I am. But, uh, but I, I really, really uh, found this to be a very uh, learning, good learning experience or an older white man. <laughs> uh, uh, last question is, did you ever notice how making a small talk in an elevator or whatever, the subject you bring up like sports can say a lot about your prejudice? That's right. Those little things can say a lot about your prejudices and preferences and what bias do you have? Yeah, but I want to I want to tell that person one thing. Remember this: there was a sportscaster when I was a when I was a teenager that used to end the, his show with this statement, and I think it is such a. I tell it to my children, my grandchildren, and that statement was he would say, "Well, ladies and gentlemen, good night. That's it in the world of sports, and remember, in the department store of life." Sports is, after all, the toy department. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. And as you get older, when I was a teenager, it was my whole life. But as you get older, then relations become important. Your children become important. Your job becomes, and your health, and issues relating to your health. So that, that statement was a good one. All right, Wayne and Anna, thank you so much for sharing with us uh, that very um, invigorating uh, presentation. Um, with that being said, um, we're on to our final and last presentation for our day.
That will promptly begin at 5 p.m. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And I will see you. We will see you in about 15 minutes. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Bye-bye, Wayne. Bye-bye, Hayward. ADR Services, Inc. has been your unwavering partner in alternative dispute resolution. But as the world changed, so did we. From virtual and hybrid hearings to our ongoing on-demand CLE program, ADR Services, Inc. continues to keep resolution and legal education at the forefront, woman-owned and operated from the start. There is someone for every situation. We are ADR Services, Inc.